Uh, are there people out there? So, our final speaker is get to getting ready. Before that, um, I'm reminded to tell you to uh, anyone who has a cell phone on, turn it off. And also, we'll remind you that following this session, there'll be a small reception outside, a short reception, and you're all invited to come. But now, our final speaker, a pro professor of sociology and criminal justice at the university, Michael Jenkins, has just returned from a Fulbright Fellowship in London, where he was posted with the Metropolitan Police. It was an experience worth its own lecture, considering the terrorist attacks in London during his stay there and continuing. So stay tuned. We'll think about that. We'll do that. In addition to his teaching and research responsibilities, Mike serves as the executive director of the Center for the Analysis and Prevention of Crime at the university. In that role, he is the quintessential scholar activist, a public intellectual, committed to using his knowledge for the greater good of the community. Please welcome him to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. And Sandra, those were very nice words. I appreciate them very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here before this distinguished group of scholars all in your own right. Um, certainly, it's an honor to be here with the other speakers who are here today and who thankfully um, have given me some fodder to draw on for my talk today. And um, what I'm hoping to do in today's talk is to just give you kind of a quick overview of important points in criminal justice, crime, and criminological history through three periods in history, the 1920s, the 1960s, and the 1990s. I want to encourage, if you do have, you know, this is, this is university for a day, and um, I'm, per, I'm obviously part of a certain generation. Um, so I have a pretty detailed PowerPoint, as well as a Twitter handle for those of you who may be inclined <laughs> to tweet. The key is, you know, you're told to shut your phones off. That's because some people can't be trusted to mute your phones. And so if you just mute your phones and shut all the, the bells and whistles off, you could still use it. And it gives you an excuse to look at your phone. Right. Um, so feel free to use that to um, criticize me or throw any other comments that you want my way. The criminal justice system is potentially one of the most invasive ways that the government can intrude upon our personal liberties. A police officer who deems it necessary can take a person, put them in handcuffs, put them in the back of their car, and put them in jail. They can also use their own judgment to lawfully use deadly force against us. When we look at the Bill of Rights, many of the amendments directly prescribe the actions of the government and how they can or cannot interact with us. So the point was previously made that the amendments, and, and specifically the Bill of Rights, applies to government actors, not private actors. And that's a really key point. Um, <coughs> It's important to note, too, that, as was read in the First Amendment, the amendments, uh, especially in the Bill of Rights, the, the um, Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth, which deal specifically with the actions of criminal justice actors, spell out pretty clearly the line for where those rights are and how the government can or cannot infringe upon those rights. But also, I think quite beautifully, and we have the expert in the room in um, Akil is the courts have found for the practice of criminal justice that very fine line between honoring the constitutional foundations of the criminal justice system and the realities that justice members face on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it's one of the themes I like to bring out um, in my classes is to just show how the founding fathers created this document. They stated quite clearly what the values are and it states quite clearly, you know, I think of the Fourth Amendment, how the police essentially can go and search our property and seize our property if they uh, believe there's evidence 
that could be used against us. Um, but it also, so it deals with those realities that police face while also upholding those, those protections that we hold so dear. As I prepped for this talk, um, I heard again university for a day and I thought that that meant I had eight hours with you. <laughs> and so um, I just found out that I only have about 45 minutes. And so I'll be doing my best to just give you a glimpse of again criminology, criminal justice and criminal justice reform um, in the United States as a way of getting us, giving us a sense of how we got to where we are today. Again, criminal justice is a hot issue. There's been a lot said, and I'm hoping to shed a little bit of light on that while making a small argument about how we might have gotten to where we are today. I also want to thank the previous speakers for offering me some cover when it comes time to place the blame on ourselves for some of the um, mistakes that the criminal justice system has made over time. So thank you. <laughs> We're going to jump right into the Wickersham Commission Report which studied the practice of cops, courts, and corrections in the 1920s. It was called the National Commission on Law Observance and Enforcement. It was the most comprehensive examination of the actions of cops, the actions of courts, and corrections officials, as well as an investigation of the causes of crime and delinquency up to that point. It published its findings in the form of a 14-volume report in 1931, which included chapters on the police, prosecution, juvenile delinquency, and, um, again, the causes of crime. And so it was a, a, a comprehensive look at crime, its causes, and our responses to it. Just as current discussions of criminal justice reform revolve around the, criminal, the criminalization of uh, drugs and anti-drug laws, the Wickersham Commission's study of the administration of justice, as it was called then, centered on the crimes associated with and the problems of enforcing prohibition. Then, as now, people debated the, the uh, effects of alcohol or drug prohibition. They realized that the enforcement of prohibition was lacking, that prohibition had caused more problems than it solved, and that the failure of the criminal justice system to bring justice to those engaged in the sale and distribution of alcohol as well as the actions that police took in enforcing the laws were oftentimes doing more harm than good for the legitimacy and efficient functioning of the criminal justice system, as we now call it. The main thrust of the report was that even though enforcement practices were lacking and popular opinion supported prohibition's repeal, the government should find additional ways to fund and organize pro prohibition enforcement. As New York columnist Franklin Adams put it, prohibition is an awful flop. We like it. It can't stop what it's meant to stop. We like it. It's left a trail of graft and slime. It don't prohibit worth a dime. It's filled our land with vice and crime. Nevertheless, we're for it. <laughs> Again, not surprising this mentality as we've seen it um, in recent history play out. While the Wickersham Report details relevant lessons in the effects of making popular drugs illicit, today I'll share with you its portrayal of the practice of criminal justice more generally. In fact, most of the report was devoted to the various branches of what we now call the criminal justice system. Again, I keep repeating that because it's an important point later on. For example, in its volume on policing and another chapter titled Lawlessness and Law Enforcement, the Wickersham Commission paints quite a damning picture of how police did their jobs, how courts processed individuals, and the way that we tried to correct their behaviors. First, due in part to their perceived ineffectiveness and corruption in enforcing laws against alcohol, there's a loss of public confidence in the police. Then, as now, police feel the strain of having too many duties placed upon them in service to their communities. Without actually offering many suggestions for improvement, again, a, report, a point we'll return to in a moment, the report concludes that change is slow due in part to humans' innate resistance to change. The report also shows how widely accepted amongst the populace was the routine police use of what we'll call extra-legal, unconstitutional methods to achieve their ends. 
And there's one Supreme Court case in particular that I will quite nervously describe given um, the attendance in this room of the constitutional scholar. And that is um, Brown versus Mississippi in 1936. Again, I think this case is a good example of how it proceeded through the system and how the formal government officials in the criminal justice system upheld the heinous practice that uh, occurred in this case. So it was 1934, Mississippi. Um, there was a white farmer who was killed by two uh, black men, or at least he, he was killed and, and, and some black men were brought in as suspects in his death. And the individuals were arrested by a mob of individual, a, 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 a mob of people who uh, tortured them into confessing. The sheriff was there at the time that this occurred and admitted that he was there at the time that this torture occurred. Um, and he admitted so even at, uh, in the subsequent inquisition of what had gone on at, the, at this time. So the suspects were brutally beaten with a leather belt strapped with metal buckles. They were stripped naked. And one of the suspects was hung up by his neck in a tree. Um, after this, they confessed to the crime. That confession was used against them during their one-day trial. The one-day trial that occurred as the defendant now still had marks across his neck from being hung up in a tree. The sheriff, again, admitted that this is what had gone on. The prosecutor agreed this is what had gone on. This is how we got the confession. And the jury convicted the men uh, for murder. As is often the case, another interesting point, um, the defendant appealed their case. And, and what is often the case is that the rights that we have as guaranteed to us by the Constitution and interpreted by the courts are given to us because of guilty people appealing their verdicts. And they're rarely appealing their guilt or innocence. They're not saying, I was innocent, I was innocent. They're saying something about the process was violated and it needs to be fixed. And so the rights that we enjoy are, are, are enjoyed because of convicted felons appealing the process as it occurred. So the defendants in Brown versus Mississippi appeal their cases to the Mississippi State Supreme Court. And the Mississippi State Supreme Court says, not our problem, not our problem. That it's not within our realm to apply the protections of the Fifth Amendment against compulsory self-incrimination and in this case that occurred in the state proceedings. Of course, then they appealed, the, uh, Brown appealed that to the United States Supreme Court who agreed with all of us that that was an egregious act and therefore applied the 14th Amendment protections of due process to the state actions in um, Brown versus Mississippi. Therefore saying that all states must follow um, the due process rights um, of individuals when they're being questioned, interrogated. Again, I give that example just as a way of stating, especially for um, the younger generation, the 19 year olds that are in my intro classes, um, just how pervasive this mentality and how accepted officially this mentality and this practice was in the criminal justice system. So back to the Wickersham Report. And then the Wickersham Report found that this practice of what they called the third degree was very common and it was the most common way to get confessions at that time. So without making specific prescriptions for police, the Wickersham Report did make some suggestions and served as an important point for criminal justice reform. I'll stick with the policing example. The Wickersham Commission made two suggestions with relevance today. Police should be more in tune with the minority customs and backgrounds of the people they police, and they should rely less on the physical force options that they have in their tool, be tool belts, and instead uh, focus on intelligence and anal analysis in driving tactics and strategies. For the criminal justice system as a whole, the Wickersham Report laid the groundwork for what would become a systems view of cops, courts, and corrections. It also influenced the academic study of criminology, which flourished at this time and helped to move 
explanations of criminal behavior away from personal individualistic explanations to more social and uh, neighborhood level explanations of crime. That then affected the report's conclusions about how we might reform individuals. Again, moving away from the indi individualistic reforms of individuals to more community-based. Finally, the report argued for a national crime database, which led to the creation of the FBI's UCR, the Uniform Crime Reports, which are still used today. Uh, they came up what we, with what we call the Part 1 offenses. They were then called the index offenses. And again, they're still the same crimes that we pay attention to today, even though I think there's a good argument to be made that other more uh, white-collar corporate crimes, um, computer crimes, might have more of a negative impact on our society. The crimes that are part of the Part 1 uh, crimes in the UCR are you know, the typical street crimes that we all think of, murder, uh, aggravated assault, arson, uh, robbery, burglary, theft, motor vehicle theft. As I mentioned earlier, the Wickersham report cast the criminal justice system in a pretty gruesome light. What suggestions they did make, however, didn't quite match up with their demands for change, which in comparison were rather weak. So they had very gruesome description of what was going on, but then had somewhat weak recommendations for how to fix it. It's believed that some of the 11 member commission were aware of how the public would view their suggestions as radical and without a widespread national body for organizing against such abuses, they knew their views would not be widely accepted. The average citizen at the time simply was not aware of or just didn't care about the unjust actions of the criminal justice system. And I think it's an important lesson when we talk about reform, and that is that we have to, uh, especially in this field of criminal justice, which is so enraptured by the status quo and um, tradition, we have to know the audience and we have to understand the timing of and the context of uh, the message that we're trying to make. Reform movement must understand their audience and where they are in their ideas about change. The system is too cumbersome, made up of too many people and involving too many constituencies for unilateral, top-down, we know best commandments. And I think that's a lesson in a different realm that we've somewhat learned from 2016, is not understanding the group that we're talking to as we're trying to get them to see other ways of either viewing a political candidate or in this case viewing criminal justice reform. And of course, the, the nation at this time was also dealing with the effects of the Great Depression and separately the subsequent repeal of prohibition in 1933, which again would greatly alter the crime and criminal justice landscape. I do believe, however, that the reform report came at a moment in history which allowed for a fertilization of reform seedlings. I don't think it's a mistake, for instance, that one of the Wickersham Commission uh, members, Walter Pollock, went on to successfully argue in Powell v. Alabama in 1932 that the courts should get involved in upholding individuals' due process rights in state court proceedings. That opened the door then for the Supreme Court in Brown versus Mississippi two years later to um, apply those protections in the Brown case. The commission report also opened the door for reformers wishing to make changes in their own agencies by giving them the external legitimacy and the justification they need to institute change. Again, I think an, an also an important point when making change is to, to give practitioners something they could point to to help them um, justify the changes that they want to make in, in their own departments. By picking up on a sometimes not so popular reform movement, national commissions give a language and organized thought to a, a minority view. They coalesce seemingly disparate experiences and progressive thought and help to find consistencies between good contemporary thinking and conventional practice. Before we turn to another important crime commission, an important decade in the 1960s, we'll take a moment to discuss the reasons we're having this talk today. Crime. As a result, as a result of prohibition in the Great Depression, overall crime rates in the 1920s soared and carried through a little bit into the 1930s. There's no shortage of explanations generally for why crime increases or decreases, and I think we're aware of many of them. 
Um, they range from uh, the legalization of abortion to removing lead in gasoline as a way of reducing crime in the 1990s. Um, individual financial strain, economic conditions, drugs, video games, better policing, more incarceration, you name it. As we go throughout today's talk, I'll hit a, a few of these explanations and, and talk about the research on it. One of the most popular hypotheses involving the drug crime connection is, um, uh, I'm sorry, one of the most popular hypotheses uh, involving uh, an explanation for crime is the, the drug crime connection. Um, for example, one of the reasons for the crime spike of the 1920s and into the 1930s was the passing of prohibition, which resulted in making a highly sought after commodity, alcohol, no longer available in the mainstream market. Criminal elements organized to meet those demands in the underground market. Describing the present day drug trade, one police chief refers to this as unregulated capitalism, where violence is a common tool for eliminating competition and collecting debts. In the 1980s, Paul Goldstein offers what's become a famous tripartite framework for understanding the drug crime connection. Um, of course, he's studying in the 1980s, very different environment than the alcohol crime connection in the 1920s. Studying in the 1980s, he says that there's three ways that dr uh, drugs and crime can be related. The first, the pharmacological effects of in ingesting drugs on an individual's propensity for violence. In the review of the scientific literature, Parker and Arhan conclude that alcohol is by far the most implicated drug in violence. Not crack, not coke, not heroin, certainly not marijuana. The second explanation is the economic compulsive effects of a drug user committing crime to get money to support their habit. And finally, the one that he finds uh, most likely in describing crime and drugs in the 1980s, which I think helps us understand the crime drug connection or the, the alcohol as a drug crime connection in the 1920s, is the, the systemic explanation. And that is that the corollary criminal effects of the system for distributing illicit drugs leads to more crime. So not only the crimes of, of dealing drugs themselves illegally, but the other violence and the other crimes that stem, stem from the illicit trade. Where alcohol was not the primary contributing factor in terms of the ingestion of a drug, Goldstein's research finds that this mechanism, the systemic mechanism, is most at play in explaining drug-related homicide. So again, this idea of kind of reefer madness, someone uh, smoking a joint and going to kill someone, um, is just not borne out in um, criminological explanations of, of crime. So we see that much of the connection bet between crime, criminal violence, and drugs is rooted in the first in the use of alcohol as opposed to other illicit drugs, and second in the systemic effects of pushing drug distribution underground. Another common correlate to crime, which is worth noting at this point in history, the 1940s, is a connection that has been established across time, across deviant behaviors, and across cultures for that matter, and that is the age crime curve. So here we have a few examples of lower level offenses that follow, follow this age crime curve connection. And we see it holds true not only for these lower level offenses, but any other type of, of violent, uh, violent crime as well that, that we might put on this um, chart. You see that between the ages of 16 and 24, or kind of the, the cutoffs, we see a, an increase in offending. Again. Uh, defined as here lower level offenses such as drunkenness, disorderly conduct, but it also holds true for other types of property crime and violence. The reason why I chose this one is because it shows just how clearly um, all of those lines match up. Why is this important? Well, what happened in the 1940s? World War II. In the 1940s, we see a drop in, in crime and many people attribute that to the shipping away, essentially, of this 18 to 24-year-old cohort that is no longer in the United States to commit these behaviors, oftentimes, that are deemed criminal. 
Okay? And then it helps us to explain in the 1960s, right, that the baby boom generation, you saw a large proportion of our overall population, again, in this crime-prone uh, age group. And then in the 1990s, we'll get there, um, but they actually, this age crime curve also helps us to explain um, why crime dropped so precipitously at that time, despite criminologists' best predictions. So our um, travels down the quick chronology of crime, criminal justice, and criminology takes us to the uh, 1930s, 40s, the boring 50s, and into the 1960s. Um, and again, I just explained that the changes in demographics as it helps us to understand changes in crime at that time. It's important to note that, um, as we said, crime remained low into the 1950s, but again to rise again in the 1960s as this baby boom generation uh, started to move in and age into this crime-prone age bracket. And that's despite an ex continuing expanding economy at this time. So we're going to turn to um, obviously an important decade in US history, and it's an important decade also for our understanding of the practice of criminal justice. In 1967, President Johnson's Commission on Law Enforcement and Administration of Justice offered their report, again, on the practice of cops, courts, and corrections. So again, it was a similar uh, presentation of the, what had gone on in the 1960s as it related to the business of cops, courts, and corrections, as well as some understandings of why we had crime, why we had juvenile offending. The 1964 presidential election had made street crime a national issue. In March 1965, President Johnson opened his message to Congress in his charge to the Crime Commission, stating, crime has become a malignant enemy in America's midst. End quote. Indeed, crime had doubled between 1940 and 1965, increasing at a rate five times faster than the population growth in just a seven-year period from 1958 to 1965. Johnson noted the need to improve education, health, welfare, recreation, and housing sectors. And of course, he helped pass important legislation in those areas. But he also added, they are not enough. Crime will not wait while we pull it up by the roots. We must arrest and reverse the trend toward lawlessness. Johnson's statements in the Crime Commission report come at a time in Johnson's presidency when he and his liberal agenda were falling out of favor. Despite the due process revolution that occurred under Chief Justice Earl Warren, the general sentiment of reform that enraptured cultural and social thinkers and Johnson's success in passing legislation that resulted in many progressive changes to immigration, education, and social welfare. The violent crime that confronted U.S. cities helped to moderate Johnson's crime and criminal justice agenda. Nonetheless, one of the firmest conclusions of the Right of Center 19-member Crime Commission report was that crime could only be stopped by changing the social environments of our country's disadvantaged neighborhoods. As Johnson would note a year later in 1966, quote, if we wish to rid this country of crime, if we wish to stop hacking at its branches only, we must cut its roots and drain its swampy breeding ground, the slum. Johnson viewed his war on crime as a natural complement to his other social justice endeavors. As Harvard historian Liz Hinton notes in her book titled From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, Johnson's desire to impose federal guidance into the ills of urban life was rooted in this view that the problems facing black urban residents stemmed from their cultural and community pathologies. In the Johnson presidency and his statements and actions on crime and the criminal justice system, we see liberal policies motivated by beliefs about the root causes of criminal behavior. However, instead of encouraging effective educational, employment, and civic opportunities for all people, regardless of their proclivity to crime or delinquency, the policies and programs as implemented 
rely too much on the intersection between disadvantaged social, condi con uh, disadvantaged social conditions and the likelihood of criminality. As a result of this new criminal justice system, um, I'm sorry, as a result, this new criminal justice system became the beast to solve our social ills. Liz Hinton and another um, scholar from uh, then Princeton, uh, Michelle Alexander, write convincingly about the recent histories of these policies and the disastrous effects they've had on U.S. communities, primarily in uh, poor and non-white areas. The interplay of two factors help to explain what I'm calling for this talk the criminal justice avalanche. First, criminological theories that animated social policy at the time, and second, this system's aspirations of cops, courts, and corrections. The 1967 report was the first time that we started to, that we actually saw in, in a um, flowchart form the business of cops, courts, and corrections as a system that works together. And I think that this, this system's metaphor um, contribute, contributed to this criminal justice avalanche that ensued. But first, some relevant criminological theory. Beginning in the early 1900s, as I mentioned before, the field of criminology was moving away from biological theories of crime. By the 1920s, scholars at the University of Chicago began to formulate what we call ecological theories that emphasize the role of neighborhood and community in explaining criminal behavior. One famous concept is called social disorganization, which says that heterogeneity in a population, persistent poverty, and transiency weaken the social control institutions of a community which are meant to uh, reduce the likelihood that people would get involved in crime. Such beliefs about criminal offending gave rise to programs that sought to increase access to recreational space, sprucing up physical disorder, and identifying and working with problem youth. Around the same time in 1938, Researchers began examining delinquent groups that were disproportionately responsible for offending. Robert Merton's strain theory looked at the interplay between social structure and criminal behavior. He argued that societal pressures to achieve the American dream caused those who cannot achieve it to feel strained and therefore to adapt in any number of ways, including criminally. Building on Merton's strain theory, which posits um, that we, should all sh that we all share a common goal of obtaining material success. Albert Cohen argues that in fact, there are different subcultures whose values don't always coincide and sometimes conflict with the dominant culture. He says that when individuals who are in these delinquent subcultures can't measure up to what he calls the middle class measuring rod, the values of the middle class, he says they experience essentially a status frustration, or the, psychologic, uh, the psychological term reaction formation. And instead of trying to continue to reach and fail for these middle class values of hard work and economic success through legitimate means, they find new ways of um, meeting those, uh, getting, getting to those means, and new ways of um, essentially living their lives. The criminologist with the most influence over the President's Crime Commission is Lloyd Olin, who served as the Associate Director of the Crime Commission. He along, with, he, along with his colleague, posited what we call the differential opportunity theory. He put forth this theory in his book on delinquent gangs in 1960. They describe how youths in disadvantaged neighborhoods adapt to a lack of legitimate opportunity and, he added, an abundance of illegitimate opportunities by adapting one of three subcultures, a retreatist subculture, a criminal subculture, or a conflict subculture. They know, as do prior theorists, the effects of limiting access to legitimate opportunities for success. But they extend their thinking in a very important way, I think, that explains where we went in criminal justice. And that is, they highlight the ample illegitimate opportunities that exist in those same neighborhoods. These opportunities determine the amount, the means, and the types of criminal behavior that will occur. 
So we see an implementation of anti-crime or crime control programs that not only support a variety of social programs to increase access to legitimate streams for pursuing the American dream, but we also experience an avalanche of criminal justice activity that seeks to limit the availability of illegitimate means for offending. If a lack of legitimate means for achieving success leads to an inability to achieve success, then reducing the illegitimate means for offending will lead to an inability to offend. Many of the general suggestions offered by the Commission report reflect Olin's vision for how society could best fit crime. I'm sorry, best fight crime. In fact, probably the most detailed uh, recommendation that the report gives is based on Olin's program that he Im implemented in New York City in the 1960s. It was called Mobilization for Youth. And it was meant to prevent delin delinquency um, through job training, psychological counseling, and a nar narcotics program for youths in, in disadvantaged areas. Um, this program was implemented in 1968 after the Juvenile Delinquency Prevention and Control Act. So again, we see Olin, who's, who's, who's motivated theoretically about, um, looking at the causes of crime as resulting from a lack of legitimate opportunities, but also an abundance of illegitimate opportunities. And so his main program that, that he gets implemented in New York City and that is implemented across the United States as a result of his influence on the report is an anti-poverty program that is focused on limiting delinquency. And he's eliminating, uh, eliminating delinquency by eliminating the opportunities for uh, crime. So what happened? How did this well attention program get so off course? In their attempt to, to divert juveniles from a life of crime, the funding for and objectives of these social programs became part and parcel of anti-crime strategies. The criminal justice system became the method for responding to society's most pressing concerns. Policy and practice saw preventing illegitimate opportunities as their main objective, instead of focusing on increasing access to legitimate means for success. The criminal justice system became the method for doing both, and it was much simpler for them to do one than the other. The first line under the objectives of the executive summary of the crime report states, first, society must seek to prevent crime before it happens by assuring all Americans a stake in the benefits and responsibilities of American life, by strengthening law enforcement, and by reducing criminal opportunities. What occurred is that for the next 30 years, the end or the goal of crime control defined the means or the methods of social improvement. And the criminal justice system became the sole respondent, or at least the main respondent to those problems. The federal government's role in conferring basic social services for those living in poor urban areas became intertwined with the criminal justice process and was motivated by ending the conditions that gave rise to crime. As opposed to offering these services as a right afforded to members of the United States wishing to live their own lives and being free from pursuing their own happiness. A criminal justice systems approach to delivering crime control and other social services via police departments, courts, and correctional facilities helped to simplify their connections between the defined problem and the appropriate policy responses. At the same time, the Crime Control Act's expanded funding for research on crime interventions. And I think research is to blame in, in a certain way too. And that's because the need for well-defined research methodologies further added to the favoring of criminal justice interventions as they were also easier to study. It's much less complicated to study a positivistic phenomenon, for example, how increasing arrest in a certain area reduces crime than it is to measure the effect of shifting sociological and political underpinnings on increasing access to the American dream. As we see here, a sample of the Commission's proposals for reaching the listed objectives vary from those that are quite vague to some that are rather distinct. Nonetheless, what ensued, I'll repeat, 
is this criminal justice system avalanche, marked by high rates of involvement in the criminal justice system and an obscene number of individuals being placed behind bars for correctional purposes. The statistics are so widely cited now that they'd almost become trite if it weren't for the harsh reality they represent. So we know that 25% of the prison population in the world is held in the United States, despite the fact that we only have 5% of the world's population. We know that we have 2.2 million people behind bars in the United States, and that number is five times higher than it was in 1972. As I mentioned before, this flowchart is the flowchart that came from the President's Crime Commission report in 1967. It tries to pre present the business of cops, courts, and corrections as a system. And yet, when we look at this, as well as the actual practice of criminal justice, it often functions as anything but a system. The conspicuousness of this image and the system's access to our everyday lives established our thinking of the criminal justice system as a we-fix-it-all system. This is a notion from which we're just starting to part ways. For too long, we invoked the criminal justice system to respond to an array of our personal and community's problems or concerns. The police showed up when other agencies couldn't or wouldn't, and the police, for too long, had limited tools for dealing with societal concerns. Namely, those tools included the power of enforcing the law and making arrests. Also at this time in the report, um, the report championed the use of the 911 system, of, of making that a system that is common across the country, which also helped to um, create this mindset as in, in us as a society that you know, when we call 911, we're going to get help. And oftentimes when we call 911, the help we're going to get is in the form of the police in the criminal justice system. Right? And so the this, this saying in, in police is, you call, we come. Right? You dial 911, people expect police to show up. We fed the beast. George Kelling, in an illuminating article titled, titled Crime and Met Metaphor, I'm sorry, um, Crime and Metaphor, describes how the system metaphor caused police to view themselves as feeders of the criminal justice beast, rather than preventers of crime or upholders of community well-being. The charge for police in a systems model is to respond to crime after it's occurred. About 85% of police citizen interactions are the result of the citizen engaging the police officer, asking them for help, as opposed to the police officer making a proactive stop of an individual or proactively getting involved with an individual. What ensued in the 1970s and 80s is the dispatching of police as responders to citizen concerns. The avalanche of criminal justice activity was also precipitated by the get tough on crime political discourse of the conservative Nixon and Reagan administrations. Specifically, in 1971, after having declared a war on drugs, President Nixon declares drug abuse, quote, public enemy number one. Whereas the war on crime understood the need to at least try to combat the root causes of criminality, Nixon's drug war viewed drug, drug addiction as a personal failing and blamed drug use for crime. As he had stated in 1967, quote, our opinion makers have gone too far in promoting the doctrine that when the law is broken, society, not the criminal, is to blame. It's at this point in history when we see the prison boom. We had already established the criminal justice system as our go-to response for the problems facing our neighborhoods. Now, Nixon and those who shared his outlook tied a common deviant behavior, which was viewed as ravaging whole communities, to crime. The routine response was no longer rehabilitation and treatment, but detection, punishment, and incarceration. Another interesting side note is that in 1974, a very well-cited paper concluded in a, a meta-analysis of prisoner rehabilitation programs that nothing works. And so the quote was, nothing works in prison rehabilitation. So you see again this research community, the criminological understanding of, of, of criminal behavior and uh, policy coming together to give us um, the circumstances that we find ourselves in today.
What's interesting too about that nothing works report is that the author thought that it would limit our use of prison, saying, listen, you're sending people to prison and people trying to be re rehabilitated in prison, it's not working. And in fact, we know that it said rehabilitation doesn't work, but maybe incarcerating people behind bars does. And so it had the opposite effect of what he thought it might have when he went on his public speaking tour of his research. And here we have, you know, almost perfectly, which is something we rarely get, um, with that dec the declaration of the war on drugs, this increase in the incarceration rate. And this is per 100,000 population starting in 1925 until 2014. And it only includes individuals incarcerated at the state and federal level. It doesn't include individuals in jail, <coughs> local jails. Part of this increase, however, is the result of an increase in violent crime. And so we see property crime here um, following similar trends over time. At the top line, we have total property crime, and then it breaks down. The red line is larceny, green is burglary, and that uh, teal, uh, teal line is motor vehicle theft. And again, we see violent crime taking that same trajectory over time. Um, again, this starts in 1960. This is based on the, the FBI uniform crime reports going to 2014. We see Crime starting to rise in the 1960s, starting taking uh, an, a precipitous increase in the 1970s, a short dip down in the first few years of the 1980s, and then um, spiking back up again at the end of the 1980s into the 1990s. And if we look at the violent crime rate, the incarceration rate, we did see how it mirrored a, a, e they mirrored each other for a bit, um, but then around 1999, after a few years of these get tough policies that were signed into legislation by the Clinton administration, we see a crossing of those two lines where the incarceration rate keeps going up while violence is dropping uh, pretty precipitously. Which brings us into the 1990s. The Great American Crime Decline, which is also a title of a book by Frank Zimmering um, on that decade. Um, it's, it's an important decade in understanding what causes crime, and importantly, what causes crime to drop. As crime rates continued their ascent in the first part of the 1990s, criminologists warned of, quote, super predators and bloodbaths in the streets as a result of a new category of immoral juvenile offender who would push crime rates even higher, even though juveniles as a proportion of the overall population um, were dropping. These conceptions of the pending violent crime problem were inculcated into the political discourse and allowed bipartisan support for the 1994 Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act. This act increased funding for the police, increased funding for prison, or prison construction, expanded the use of the death penalty at the federal level, and created 50 new federal offenses it also instituted harsher mandatory minimum sentences. It was signed by President Clinton and supported uh, by people across the political spectrum. What we didn't know in this fur at the time was that crime had already commenced its downturn. 1993 started a period of drastic and sustained reductions in crime. Murder dropped to 40 year lows by 2002. Part one crimes, the street crimes I mentioned before, dropped between 23 and 40 percent. While there's no single explanatory factor, shifting demographics, police professionalism, and more effective security measures played some part. And the common refrain of improving economic and better st structural conditions likely did not account for much of the decline. When studying the crime decline, the 1990s figure most prominently. We learned that the context of crime matters. The combinations of multiple variables affect whether or not crime increases or decreases. And that it's important to specify how things work, when they work, in what environments against what crimes. The case of New York City in the 1990s is the lab for much research on crime and its correlates. In the 1990s, crime in New York City dropped twice the national average the largest and most sustained crime drop in history. 
As Zimring writes in another book of his, The City That Became Safe, the police did do something about crime and drug-related violence, even while reducing the prison population and while illegal drug use remained high. No pun intended. The incarceration rate was cut in half from 1995 to 2016, while a serious crime rate was cut by 58%. At the same time, incarceration rates across the country grew by 12%, and the nation experienced a much more modest decline in crime. New York City did this, in part, by limiting misdemeanor drug arrests and instead making them a ticketable offense, loosening harsh sentences, and instituting diversionary programs such as the Drug Treatment Alternative to Prison Program. Police had changed their orientation. No longer were they feeders into a harsh system, but pro professionals in collaboration with others responsible for the long-term health and well-being of their neighborhoods. Despite a few years of crime creep in the first years of the 2000s and a potential present trend upward, crime has generally remained low across the United States. As a result, we're in a climate that is friendly to rehabilitative, preventive, harm reduction reforms dealing with crime and other social problems. Vitally, much of the discussion centers around bipartisan solutions. Criminal justice reform has enjoyed national leadership from the previous presidential administration, as well as grassroots support and popular demand. One sign of this political shift is that we're now seeing former public defenders elected to prosecutions or prosecutors' positions. It's no longer politi politically expedient to be tough on crime. Liberals are finally finding our footing in championing rehabilitative, community-based solutions and are joining with conservatives interested in limiting government control over our lives and fiscal responsibility. The reforms take many forms, eliminating the grossly unconstitutional practice of jailing people who cannot afford to pay fines or court fees, increasing the minimum age at which one can be considered for an adult prison sentence. For example, Connecticut has increased that to 21. Decarceration policies and practices such as California's Proposition 47, President Obama's clemency to nonviolent drug offenders, and limiting the use of mandatory minimums. Harm reduction policies that use the arrest function to focus on serious, repeat, violent criminals, and encourage police to call on other agencies to deal with problems that are no longer appropriate for criminal justice intervention, such as drug addiction and mental illness. Okay, so I've spoken now for um, almost an hour, and we learned how to improve our treatment of the crime problem, how to speak about crime, how we can prevent crime in a more just way without unreasonably hindering large swaths of persons' individual freedoms. But now it's time to throw that out the window. President Trump wants to bring tough on crime back to America. He's voiced his support for brutal, heavy-handed policing, longer prison sentences, wider use of the death penalty, and increasing mandatory minimums to fight the opioid dose, uh, overdose epidemic. More directly, he has ended the practice of allowing federal oversight of police departments engaged in a pattern of unconstitutional behavior. This is an important tool for helping to reform specific police departments, and it's a, and it's a tool that reform-minded police chiefs can rely upon with government assistance to help them make the changes that are necessary so that they could police our cities in more just ways. As we've seen, the president has the imperative to set and frame the criminal justice agenda. We've seen recently that criminal justice practice at the local level can and does change in reaction to national politics more so than any other part of the criminal justice system or other public se sectors such as education. Part of this is due to the vastly discretionary work of police and the lack of national standards uh, for police compared to other sectors. Um, I saw this in, in my own research recently where I was working with a student to um, see how local immigrants, particularly Latino immigrants, 
experience the criminal justice system. And in our study of their views of the criminal justice system, what was the most robust finding was their fear of deportation and their fear of uh, the Trump administration. And so we see views of, of criminal justice practitioners being entwined with um, the, the speeches and the discourse that the president is, is giving us as it relates to immigration. Uh, we also saw this with, or it also I think speaks to this, this issue in policing of, of militariza um, militarization of police where it's not so much that they would use the tactics or that they would have this weaponry. Uh, for me, it's, it's the end as they see it and how police are defining their roles in our communities. And President Trump has done a lot no, not only to, to increase the um, use of these tactics by local police in our communities, but he's done a lot to kind of gin up support for this warrior mindset, which I think is harmful to police in our, in, and our um, communities as a result. However, I'm hopeful, and that's because there are people like us, and the practice of criminal justice is ultimately locally controlled. For example, 90% of people in prison are in state and local fac facilities, and nearly all of the 18,000 police departments are at the local level. To ensure lasting change, we need to keep conversations going we need to hold the spotlight on criminal justice practice, and we need to act locally. Act in our own local elections, act in your own criminal justice systems, and most importantly, act in our own neighborhoods. And then, since we were given this great quote by Churchill, um, I think what we'll find is that we will do the right thing. We've already done a lot of the wrong things, and I think the time is right, <laughs> despite our national leadership, um, for us as a country to come together and continue the reforms of criminal justice. Thank you. And comments, okay. Hi. Um, I recently saw a segment of 60 Minutes where they talked about uh, the sheriff of the Cook County prison in Chicago. Um, the overwhelming message after seeing that, and, I, and I'm not sure how recent it is because I tape everything, so. Um, but the overwhelming message at the end of that was race and uh, mental health and he was uh, he seemed very willing to try and take care of his population and to talk to them and he, he it, during the segment we saw some of the people telling why they were in jail and they said someone someone had uh, stolen $70 worth of meat Someone had had something wrong with their car and they were stopped. And they were all black and they all, they, none of them could pay their $70 to get out of prison or $100 or whatever they had to pay. Whereas the, the really criminal people who had been, had been arrested had had their cohorts pay to get them out because they were valuable to them on the street rather than in jail. So, I mean, it was, it was horrible. It was horrible to see the injustice in this. I mean, we aren't all born created equal, but we are supposed to be equal under the law. Mm -hmm. And this is not happening. No. No, you're absolutely right, and um, I purposely did not describe much as it relates to race or uh, socioeconomic status in my talk because these are talks, you know, for a whole other sessions. Um, but but you're absolutely right in that people are treated differently in the system. Um, definitely in, in terms of sometimes even the law based on your finances, whether you could afford bail or not, right? That's one clear example in which people are sitting in jail. The only difference between them and someone else is that they could afford bail, period. As well as 
um, issues of race that, again, oftentimes coincide with issues of, of socioeconomic status. Um, so yes, I mean, those are important areas that we have to consider. And I think when it comes to those issues, uh, we have a lot of control over improving those at the local level, including in this locality right here. I know for, for a fact, there might be some criminal defense lawyers in here, you could confirm this, there are people sitting in the Lackawanna County Prison simply because they can't afford to pay court costs and fees associated with their stay. And so they're being held at a cost that costs more to hold them in prison um, than they owe for those fees. And it's only because they can't afford it. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that is the, the, the bigger justice issues of the system. And uh, how do we get around that? It's, it's, you know, it's incremental, I think, and a lot of it starts at the local level. And what can you do at, at the local level if you have, I mean, for instance, you have, okay, <laughs> what can we do on a local level? And the, the three black young men who were found in the last couple of weeks guilty of killing the police officer in Scranton because he, he fell during Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. trying to apprehend him <coughs> during a robbery. They were, they were black. They were, um, they were found to be, uh, they were being prosecuted as adults. Now, how can, you, how can you stop that from happening? I mean, if somebody's 17 and they're not supposed to be prosecuted as an adult, why are they, you know, if they're black, why are they prosecuted as an adult? I think this is... How can, how can we do anything about things yeah. like that. This is where I think voting becomes important. You know, we just saw in Connecticut they did raise the age at which someone could be essentially uh, sent to prison uh, for a crime that they committed under the age of 21, right? Um, so there's legislative changes in that regard in terms of at what age do we start treating someone as an adult in the criminal justice system versus a juvenile in the juvenile justice system. But then also in terms of voting, uh, we have currently in Lackawanna County um, a DA's race in which the two candidates, including the Democrat, who uh, was a defense attorney, is showing, are, are vying to be toughest on crime, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's one of the billboards is tough on crimes. They're arguing over um, who's tougher on crime and why are they doing that? I'm sure they have personal views that might not agree with that tough on crime, but they're doing it because that's what we want. That's what's going to get them votes. And so, um, and the DA's have a lot of control over some of the issues that, that you raised in terms of how people are charged, in terms of um, if people are gonna end up in, uh, in jail while they wait trial, if the bail is going to be administered, et cetera. So um, yeah, those are the, the, the most complicated issues that, that we have to deal with. Okay. He has the uh, microphone. Yeah. Uh, two things that you didn't touch upon. One, the motivation to uh, uh, keep people who have been convicted of crimes from voting, mm -hmm. and maybe keep people from voting because you make them criminals, and two, the effect of the privatization of the prison yeah. systems. Yeah. There's a whole bunch I didn't hit on in this talk, so I, I hope I didn't give you the impression that I was trying to cover it all, although I did try to cover a lot. Um, and um, that is a place where also we're, we're making some strides in terms of uh, felony disenfranchisement, right? So we are, at the state level, um, increasing the ability of people who've been convicted of a, of a felony to vote. So we're, we're essentially, um, once someone is out of prison, they've done their time, and we're starting to find these new ways of bringing them back into society and not continuing to punish them for their, their crimes. I also think related to that is this whole ban the box movement, right? Where essentially if you're applying for a job, you have to check a box that says, I've been arrested. Um, and that the idea is that, that checking that box eliminates your, your likelihood in, in a tough employment um, e economy to limit your, your probability that you'll get a call, right? And so we've seen movements at the state level to make that illegal. Um, and then your second issue, your second issue was um, Privatization, yeah, um, that figures in, I think, in increasingly so um, because of the kind of the perverse incentives that are obviously there. However, I think there are ways you could use the incentives in positive ways. So for example, 
Um, we often think of uh, private prisons earning money based on getting people behind bars, right? Getting people into their, their, their prisons. However, if we start to hold these private prisons accountable for outcomes, such as not recidivating, right, not reoffending, well then maybe we could actually use the private sector to improve the ways that we, we house and rehabilitate individuals. Um, I do think one concern with the Trump administration is the ability, uh, politically, given control of, of um, the federal government as it is, um, to potentially increase the privatization of different aspects of the criminal justice system. And it's something we need to be mindful of. I don't think it's something that is inherently bad, although um, it's something that you have to make sure that is done uh, in, in the right way. What's the definition of crime, and should it be redefined? Yes, without a doubt. Um, so I, I will make, I have a couple students here. In my intro to criminal justice class, I, I make the entire class say all together, I am a criminal. Right? I, have, I have committed a crime. And the, the idea is that criminal behavior is simply a behavior that we've defined as criminal. Right? And it's behavior just like anything else. And we've all done things that, um, you know, in our present lives even, we've done things that in certain cultures might be considered criminal today. We, we have all done things that uh, possibly in recent history in the United States might have been considered criminal. And so again, one of the things I, I wanted to work in was, um, was what you're implying there, and that is that here in, in the 21st century, we see a reduction in crimes, but we're seeing a reduction in those, those index offenses that the FBI has been measuring since 1930, right? Those street crimes that commonly gather our attention. Even though there are plenty of crimes, um, you know, financial fraud, generally uh, co corporate crimes as they're generally just, um, defined, as well as um, computer crimes that are having a, a big impact on, on our wallets, on our safety, um, on our privacy, right? Um, and so that obviously I think is going to be the future. As interactions change, the nature of interactions change, um, so too will the criminal definitions of which of those interactions are considered crimes, right? Um, but I don't know what, you know, what about them? I, I don't know except that they, there's some actually some good research that one of my friends has done, um, and she argues that it's it's because we've moved our interactions into the, the virtual world. Um, some of the crimes that were traditionally street crimes are now, you know, moving, and we're not counting them. We're not tracking them in any good way, right? So. Thank you. I, I, I can't begin to sum up all we've learned today. Uh, from our four speakers, but I, it has been a lot. But for me, um, I can only say uh, it's it's about we the people trying to trying to make this place better. It's in our hands. It's hard. It's very hard, but it is in our hands. So thank you for coming and join us for a reception out in the lobby.